Hey there folks, welcome back to Let's Play Limbo. Almost thought I wasn't going to make it there. Actually, while I'm thinking about, um, about character death here, uh, Trevor Johnson of Game Elitist pointed something out that I thought was interesting and that I kind of brought up a little bit in the last episode um, when I was saying how odd it was that in a game all about being in the in-between space between life and death um, one of the main teaching tools is repeated character death and uh, Trevor Johnson points out that even the character death in this game can be interpreted as being something symbolic if you think about it, you're playing as a frail, vulnerable child, and that that uh, constant death that uh, new players experience, and I experience often when I'm not paying attention to the puzzles, is kind of a tool not only to, to teach the player or to punish, but also to illustrate just how how vulnerable this child is. I mean, really, it doesn't take a whole lot to kill him. You can simply stand under a crate that falls from a low height and be crushed. Oh, forgot to remove the brain slug there. Actually, I didn't forget to remove the brain slug so much as I got impatient and jumped a bit too quick because if I had waited a couple more seconds there, you saw that the uh, the, the glowworm-eating creatures were just above, so I just had to wait on the ladder a couple seconds more. just have to wait on this ladder. And while we're waiting here, I actually just thought of another theory to explain the events of Limbo. And I'm thinking that it might be about a... Uh, this, this is out there and not completely supported or fully fleshed out. But it might be about a, a child who died <clears throat> sometime in the era where uh, child labor was being used um, heavily in... in manufacturing plants and you would constantly read um well not you or i since we're far too, presumably far too young to actually remember that happening but there would always be um stories about how a kid would work a 16 hour day and end up getting his hand caught in machinery or something, something of the like that was equally gruesome. And thinking about it, it actually does contextualize a lot of the hazards that you experience along the way in Limbo. Uh, the saw blades, the falling crates, all the industrial uh, sections that are uh, coming up. I think I might be too far out to reach the rope and I can't let this float away. There we go. Come to think of it, you can actually combine the car crash theory in some ways with the idea that maybe this kid died 
um, during the era of, of heavily employed child labor as perhaps the kid died in an in, in automobile factory. Also, given that um, that theory would set the game far before uh, the modern era, the the black and white art style could actually have a dual meaning aside from be from representing uh, the duality of, of life and death and that in between point that is limbo. It could also be used to indicate um, time in the same way that when you watch an old program like uh, I Love Lucy, for instance. Um, you would watch it in black and white because that's, at the time, the shows were in black and white. So the black and white of Limbo could um, serve as a symbol for the, for the setting being far in the past. Still not quite sure where the, the lit up hotel sign falls into place in the store um, in the context of the story though. Because this isn't the only time we see it. Nor am I really too sure about this last stone here. I mean, I could totally just be um, grasping at straws and really reading far too much into this, or rather, looking for for um, story context in too many places. But it's still interesting to ponder just how much is deliberate in in trying to deliver this narrative and how much is just there for the, the sake of gameplay. That is one of the harder things to to figure out when developing theories or trying to interpret what's going on in the game is that it's hard to tell whether or not something has symbolic value or whether or not it's just there to be a puzzle to complete for for the sake of uh, the satisfaction of completing a, a section of gameplay. But that's the wonderful thing about this kind of implicit storytelling is that it bucks authorial intent in that if you care to, you can ascribe meaning to virtually anything and contextualize everything if you so desire if that w if that's what stimulates you and that's what I choose to do I tend to look for as many explanations as possible because that's the wonderful thing about this game is that it gives you so many wonderful options to to puzzle over no pun intended <laughs> And some of this is really hard for me to see because I'm playing in the wee hours of the morning when daylight's just breaking through my window and causing a really nasty glare on my screen. So, puzzles that are ordinarily a bit 
difficult to na uh, to navigate visually or uh, quite a bit more so for me right now and I think I'm oh, just barely made it you know I've spent a lot of time just kind of uh, navel gazing over the the symbolism in the game and the implicit storytelling in the narrative and all that. But I mean, I also have to give credit to it purely on the basis of its gameplay ignoring all narrative. It's still a fun, challenging, satisfying puzzle game. Puzzle platformer, rather. I really do enjoy most of the puzzles in this game, except ones like these that um, depend on you teetering these beams or um, a couple puzzles where you have to teeter a rope. Because not only are the puzzles well designed and fun, they also follow a very consistent internal logic. And I have to grab the crate that we passed earlier. We should actually be able to finish the game in this sitting. I don't know about this episode, but definitely this sitting. And we're going up here to get yet another egg. I'm not sure if I specified before, but um, if there are other hidden eggs other than the ones that are achievement related or trophy related, um, I don't know about them, and so I'm only going to be going for the ones that I do know about, which are the ones that you would get a ordinarily get an achievement for, like this one, and all the ones we've gotten previously. I'm not sure if there are other eggs aside from those. Oh, and um, I mentioned at the start of, I think, episode one, that the PC version of the game had an additional hidden level, and I've since confirmed that that's true, and it's also in the PS3 version of the game, but unfortunately not the 360 version. Oops. Stagger this a little bit. Because we need to make sure it falls on this crate. And you see what I was talking about earlier, where it does not take a whole lot to kill this kid. Again, illustrating just how vulnerable he is. I 
There we go. And before we take that ladder up here, there's another egg down here that's a little bit tricky. Once you get low enough in this hill, you want to listen for the sound of water and then just kind of make a blind leap of faith. And did I get it? No, I died. I'll give that one more shot. It's funny because the first time I, I went for this egg, I got it on the first try, and then each time I've played through the game since and gone for that egg, it's taken me three or four tries. I'm just inching my way forward here. I think I'm going to back up and take a running leap. And I think I died. Alright, one more. And if I don't get it, you still know it's down there and generally how to get to it. You just need to execute with a bit more finesse than I'm apparently capable of at this particular moment. We can just ignore that for now. I really don't want to waste too much time going after that. The trip back up is actually not as hard as it is going down, so that's something that you don't really have to worry about too much. Be very quiet. Aha, I am Lord of the Flies. Or Lord of the Fly, rather. And you notice that we have yet another tire. I don't know if you noticed the, the burning tires earlier or some of the other ones that have come up, but tires are a reoccurring theme in this game. Which again lends credence to the car crash theory. Here we have yet another egg coming up, right here. And the only reason you need to go through all of that 
instead of just hitting the lever is because if you hit the lever, the cog will start spinning and you won't be able to reach the egg before it falls into the, the pit there. I think it's even in the achievement description that I think that's the one about not pulling the lever or don't rush to pull it or something. first time I did this puzzle I was I kept worrying that the gears would crush the uh, one of the, the crates once it hit that um, the, the solid plane or rather uh, once it hit flat ground I thought it, they would end up squeezed together. This puzzle, I hate this one. Because, it, again, it's one of those swinging, teetering kind of puzzles. I'm just going to swing back and forth a little bit here to get the chain moving. Actually, not sure if there's a better way to go about doing this, but this is the way I've always done it. No, it's not too bad. The only really annoying thing about failing um, the puzzles in this area of the game when things start to become more industrialized is that, especially here and in the next two or three puzzles, where uh, the perspective starts to, to rotate around, is you tend to have to do a lot of waiting to reset the situation. Like there, that was probably a solid 25-30 seconds of just waiting for the screen to rotate. should be good enough. Just make sure I can make that jump. Okay. That's fine. Oh yeah, that's plenty of leeway.
now we're gonna do some more waiting. Take note though, um, just the fact that the screen in this area of the game is constantly rotating. You're constantly just being thrown around and I might fail this puzzle. Okay. Nah. You're kind of uh, constantly being tossed and tumbled around from this point forward. The screen will either be rotating or we're going to be um, going off in all sorts of directions. Upside down. And that is... This is one of the most interesting parts of the game. Because you see a figure that looks... Uh, a silhouette that looks like a girl. Another kid kneeling down. And we're going to see that character later on in the game again. And then... This happens. Suddenly, the area that we just came from is gone and replaced with another um, heavy, heavily industrialized area. So we've lost sight of this kneeling girl. That scene makes me think that the um, the insane theory, which postulates that perhaps um, the kid is dead, but rather he has just gone crazy, might actually be incredible. And if anything's causing that insanity, uh, perhaps these brain parasites actually have a place contextual, contextually within the narrative. So these brain slugs burrowing into the kid's head, they might symbolize mental illness if you care to take that perspective. In fact, you can, re you can recontextualize the entire game that way. Even the point A to point B trek from the start of the game to the end represents representing one's lifetime. It can be said to be fraught with the additional obstacles unique to those with certain conditions. Hell, this this metaphor doesn't even necessarily have to be limited to mental disorders. Even terminal and crippling uh, physiological ones can be brought under that umbrella. In that way, the metaphor of limbo, the contrasting silhouettes and all of that that we've gone over so much, they might also symbolize a life that, due to the additional hardships faced by the terminally ill and mentally ill, uh, might, for some, never be as fulfilling, like a half of a life, a life that's hollowed by those hardships. Given the bleak and oppressive tone of the game overall, depression and anxiety are certainly some of the most notable candidates for that metaphor. And I don't mean to imply that you can't lead a full and meaningful life with any of these disorders, uh, mental or physical, but merely that those additional car uh, hardships caused by, the, uh, by these, dis these kinds of disorders um, can certainly erode away at a person's sense of self, at a person's um, outlook on life. One might feel as though they are leading a less fulfilling life than someone not stricken with that kind of malady. Alright, I'm running a bit low on time, so I think I'm going to cut the episode right about here. Thanks for watching, everybody. Until next time, have a good one. Be sure to tune in to the next episode.